Jesus' name we pray and everyone said, Amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Merry Christmas. What? Christmas Eve? Come on. Some of y'all are already looking at the gifts under the tree. If you're like my family, we didn't did it yesterday. <laughs> we're like, man, you know what? We like met up and we're like, all right, let's, get, let's change gifts. Because to us, it's more about hanging out. You know, we don't got like little, little ones. You know what I mean? So we're, everybody knows where they're coming from. And so, uh, you know, but we had an incredible time. So I'm praying that you guys have enjoyed. Be present. You know, a lot of times we're focused on the presence. Be present. You're the present. You're the gift. You know, be present in that thing, right? Don't be on your phone. Like, be present. You might miss a moment. Because that's why you got together. Right? Call somebody. Forgive them. I don't know. Be present. Amen? Amen. And so, you know, I know a lot of times, you know, people are like, oh, you know, we go to church and today, you know, the, the message is about, you know, the nativity scene and Jesus being born in a manger. And even though I love the message, I'd like to say that, you know, I'm going to pray, I'm going to preach what God is telling me to preach. And so I always tell people how you end the year is how you're going to start it. So I wanted to preach a message today, which is probably uh, way off from Jesus in the manger. But we know that he was born with a purpose. It wasn't just he was born in a manger. There's a purpose for him being born. And I want you to not just have an incredible 2024, but I believe that I'm on assignment with the word today that will not just impact 2024, but it will impact the rest of your life. And so the beginning of the year is the perfect time to fast. You know, we used to do the 21 days of prayer and fasting, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. And, I'm, you know, you're, as we get into the message, you'll choose your thing. But we want to do a seven-day corporate fast. And the reason why we're doing that is because, you know, we used to pray for 21 days because that's what everybody did. So then we just kind of, to be honest, I was like, well, I guess that's what we do, 21 days of prayer and fasting. And so the Lord was like, that's not what I'm asking you to do. He said, I want you guys to pray for seven days corporately. And so, you know, all right, you know, we're going to be the only one seven days, you know. It's kind of how it felt when I first did it, you know, because everybody was, what happened to the 21? And so we, it's, we're going to abstain from food to weaken the flesh and strengthen the spirit. We're going to grow in 2024 spiritually, physically, and mentally. And the reason we start January 1st, right, because in the beginning I used to be like, oh, I don't know if people are going to show up. Everybody's still like New Year's Day hanging out. And he's like, I didn't ask you if anybody was going to show up. He said, you show up. And so the reason we do it January 1st, just to give everybody a why, is because it's the first day of the year, and you probably want to go do something. But the first day of the year, last I checked, I want to give, the goal is that we're dedicating ourselves to God and boldly stating that we're putting God and his kingdom rule first. So you're kind of like a first fruit on January 1st. Because you could come up with 50,000 reasons why not to show up. But I see like he likes first stuff. He likes to be put first. He enjoys that. So I'm going to give him the first day of the year. Are you with me? Because you could do whatever you were going to do on, the, on another day. And it's, it's because we have these desires and these feelings. And when we talk about get wrapped, why we're here, you know, we say stuff like to help everyone develop an intimate relationship with God. We say stuff like, we make Christ known by the way we love everywhere we go, meaning if you're in your, no matter where you're at, you're representing Jesus. And we add it, and it starts at home. And the reason why we added that at Get Wrapped was because I get to travel, I got to see a lot of things, I know a lot of behind the scenes, and I started seeing people that were ministering that really weren't living that out in their homes. And so I was like, look, the first place we have to do this, we make Christ known by the way we love to Ruthie and my kids before anywhere else. Because from that, everything else will be successful. Because if you can't manage your home or even yourself, why would you go get into anything where you have to manage people? That's what he's basically saying. So when we talk about that, you know that when we say love, everybody say crucified life. Crucified life. That's what we're talking about. 
I know everybody, you know, they see that and they go, oh, you know, make love. It's got to be. No, love is everything. If in the right perspective. Because God's preferred choice, agapo, to love, means you have to die to your flesh so that you could do something led by the Spirit. Love. So if we're going to do that, then we need to understand fasting and praying. We need to understand fasting and praying. We say we're citizens of heaven. Heavens, come on, we represent. We represent. What does that mean? That whoever you encounter, they should encounter heaven, not your selfish, fleshy self. Because then you're not being a good representative. You only come into the house of God to see what he could do for you, selfishly. Or you're thinking, I'm going to go be a good representative. And yes, you might miss it here and there, but missing it with, a, with applying a biblical concept immediately after and not two years later says a lot. And so we live with the identity of death, burial, and resurrection. It's not just an Easter service. We actually live from that all the days of our lives. That's why 2024, we're, all our worship and all the things that we do is going to be called, it was the first time it was His name, then it was His name together, now it's in His image. Because this year, we're, I'm just foolish enough to believe these things. That if we pray, if we learn to pray, and we fast, and we disciple, maybe everything else takes care of itself. Could it be that Jesus was warning us about the future when he said, there are many teachers, but not enough fathers? In other words, there's a whole lot of people who like to preach and teach. There's nobody really that likes to walk alongside someone and help them grow. And that's why we got a bunch of immature people running around wanting to do everything in their first two years of Christianity. Whose fault is that? Your kid will take the car at 13 if you give it to him. Don't get mad when he gets in a wreck. I remember, I remember, I don't know if you remember, but I remember, you know, I remember back in the day, you know, I had my run DMC, went like, wow, look this way, you know, I should have wore the hat, but I remember, like, back in the day before I had Jesus, you know, any given day when something was difficult, and I know you don't know nothing about this, but, you know, times were difficult, so I, you know, I go to the club, you know, to feed the flesh, because when I got to the club, it seemed like all my problems went away. Hey, listen, when we got a six-pack, 12-pack, 24-pack, y- y'all don't know nothing about 48-pack, you know, but back in the Lowen Brown days, for all my New Yorkers watching, you know, we, we drank Lowen Brown. We got watched until the sun came up, you know, because we had problems, so we would intoxicate ourselves. Come on, because the flesh was like, feed, feed me. Let me be at peace. Hey, you know, you got in relationship. I know nobody does. You got in relationships too fast, or you went into a relationship that, you know, turned out to be catastrophic. Because it eased the pain. You know, that night, mate, you know, oh, all my problems have gone away. I, I know none of y'all know about this, but when I have problems, I wake up in the morning or at night or in the midday or in the car or outside the car or it doesn't matter what day it was, whether it was Christmas or Columbus Day. And <laughs> now, y'all don't, none, of, none of y'all know nothing about that. But that's what we did, though. That's what we did. We fulfilled the flesh. Whatever the flesh asked for, we did. But I know none, none of y'all know nothing about that. Y'all don't know holding on to the steering wheel. Why? Y'all don't know about that. But that's what you did to fulfill the flesh. You, you, whatever it needed to actually feel peace, which was an imitation of peace, you actually did that. The problem is when we get saved and we still look exactly or try to find peace exactly the same way we did when we were in the world. That's when we're getting into a problem. So I'm going to read you something straight from the Bible. It's Matthew 6, and we're talking about fasting, but a lot of times, you know, there are people who can diet well. They diet well. They just don't devote themselves to Jesus while dieting. You know, they, they fast in a sense. You fast, but you don't pray or read your Bible. And so you, you just have really good diets. And so you look good physically, but spiritually you're overweight. 
And so I'm going to read you something out of Matthew 6 because I thought it was super interesting how he talks about giving, praying, and, and fasting all in the same text. And he, and he covers prayer this much and then fasting right here at the end. So it's like a part, like you can't remove those. They're both as equally important. And then we'll show you where Jesus fasted and how he implemented these things. And I believe that the American culture have gotten into the church. And so that's why, you know, yeah, I'm fasting Instagram. You know, I'm fasting and nothing's changing in your life because those are just distractions. So you remove the distractions to also devote. But what craves and urges is your body and your flesh. And so here, I'm just going to read this real quick, and we're going to start at 5. But in 2, look what it says. So whenever you give to the poor, don't sound the trumpet. Now, there's a lot of times he uses metaphors. You know, in the giving, it was, a, it was actually a trumpet that they used to put the money in. So uh, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be applauded by people. Uh, understand this, because sometimes we take this and we go, don't do it like this. He, he is saying, whenever you give to the poor, don't sound the trumpet, and he keeps going, and he always uses the word, don't do this like. In other words, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others, to be seen by them, and he's always using either like as a hyperbole, here he's using metaphoric things, because he's always using terms that they understand. In other words, don't, 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 don't do things just to be seen. And you know, a lot of times it's kind of funny, because you know, the people he's talking to probably they didn't think that they were doing it to be seen. They probably added God to it or Jesus at the end of the sentence and it made it all good. But we all struggle with this. That's what, and no, if you're just, if you believe in God, period, you shouldn't, we shouldn't be begging you to give. Because he says whenever you give, that means you're a giver. And then, let me go to five. I just wanted to throw that in there because for some reason he threw it all into the whole same context. Stop doing things so that you could be seen. It's not about you. That's why we try to put God on the calendar rather than you fulfilling God's calendar and working around that. That's why we're like, we're doing seven days of prayer and you start looking, well, I can make it Monday. I can't make it. That's what we do. And then, when your life is in shambles, you want to try to fix all your fleshly problems that you're having but look at what he says whenever you pray I, I just love the whenevers because he's assuming that as a believer you're praying he's assuming that if you have a relationship with God you have a prayer life so he's like whenever you pray you must not be like hyperbole right I had to learn English at 36 it's crazy I didn't my teachers in high school would be so proud of me now I didn't want to learn. They're like, I told you you had to learn that. <laughs> you know, I just wasted time. But he's like, uh, you must not be like. So he's saying, whenever you pray, so he knows we're going to be praying. He's like, but when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. Don't be like them. So he's telling you what not to pray like. Because they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by people. Truly, I tell you, they will have their reward. Then he goes into don't pray and babble like the Gentiles. They imagine that they'll be heard for many words. Don't be like them because your father knows the things that you need before you ask him. I love reading this stuff. Because then I start thinking, well, you know, because people will say today, when you go to Israel, you know, they're all like, you know, praying. They'll get up in the middle of the plane. You know, they'll do all the stuff. I mean, right in the middle of the plane. Like, they're all going to the back. There's a whole crew of them, and they're all, everybody's praying. It's trippy. I was like, man, they're doing this in the middle of the plane. I said, ain't no Christian over here praying, you know. But it's all about, look at how holy I look. It's a heart, heart posture. So he's not saying not to pray. He's saying whenever you pray, pray, don't be like this. You know, or maybe you know the guy that, you know, or the girl that when she prays, she starts preaching a sermon. See, she might not think, well, I don't want to be seen. That's just the way I pray. No, you're doing that because you want to be seen. Because praying is not about preaching a sermon. Prayer is about communicating to God. It's funny because when I used to do the Spanish service, when, you know, I just felt more comfortable praying in English, and so I would tell them in Spanish, yo voy a orar en, en inglés. And so they would be like, 
confused because, and I go, and I would tell him, I'm not praying to you. So it doesn't matter if you understand me. <laughs> so I'd start praying in English, and they'd be like wondering what I'm saying. But what I was trying to teach them is that I'm not praying to you. I'm praying to him. So whether you understand me or not, it's irrelevant. Do you understand that? Because sometimes we use prayer as counseling sessions. We'll be there for 40 minutes counseling. It's like, no, you, you're praying to God. And then if we want to talk, we go to the side. It's so interesting, interesting that he's like, don't do it. Don't be like this. Don't pray like this. Don't pray like this. And then, and then all of a sudden, therefore, you should pray like this. So he doesn't say pray this. That's where, you know, growing up, Catholicism and all that, right? Big shout out to my Christian uh, Catholic brothers. But, but listen to what he's saying. Therefore, you should pray like this. He doesn't say pray this. And so I thought pray this, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be When I got in trouble, I'd recite that sucker quick. <laughs> you know, it depends what neighborhood I was in. I'd switch it to Spanish. Padre nuestro que está en el cielo, santificado sea tu nombre. I didn't understand none of the words. I didn't know what, what they meant. They had no meaning, no depth. It was just recite this thing, babble it out, and, you know, come through. <laughs> come through. <laughs> you know, you're hoping that by the time you finish, that kingdom come, that will be done. You know? Bam, he's there. And it's like, no, that's, this is supposed to have, he's saying like this because there's depth to this. Starting in January 1st, we're gonna, I'm going to show you here what we're going to be praying about corporately. And uh, I'm also going to teach on the first day just the Lord's Prayer a few things. Probably the only day there's going to be like a teaching teaching. The rest of them are just going to be, you know, what we're praying about and we're going after it. Okay? So he says, pray like this. He says, our Father in heaven. That's so good. Your name be honored as holy. Okay, period. Now, now these are all thoughts. You know, I never, you know, really stopped at the period. <laughs> I should just keep going. But he's like, uh, our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. You know what that means? Because a lot of times when we come to the Father, our Father too, because he's not just my Father, he's your Father too. And I know I like all my kids to get along. That's how our Father is. Right? So he says our Father He's basically saying, hey, don't come demanding anything, because we do that. We come to God. You ever, any of y'all have children? Okay. Even young adults, students. And so sometimes they come at you and forget that you're a father. Right? If you, somebody comes at you sideways, you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm your father. That's what he's saying. He's like... Our Father, like, don't come at me. Come at me knowing, hey, I'm your Father. So I have a little bit of reverence. That's why he says holy, right? A little bit of reverence. Don't come like, you know, Dad, because that's fear. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You don't want to wait till your father gets home. You're like, oh, my God, I'm going to die. No, no, no. He, he's he, Father. Just, I'm your Father, you know. That's why I'm really against, like, oh, this is my best friend. And I'm like, no, no, you're not. You're the parent. Now, you can kick it and have a good time, but don't ever lose the father. You get what I'm saying? So that's what he's saying there. So don't demand it. Don't be like that. And then he says, your kingdom come, period. Because I used to do your kingdom come, your will be done, right? But this time I was studying it, and I was looking at it, and I was like, oh, my God. It has a period. It was probably the most exciting <laughs> period I've seen in my life. I was like, it's a stop. And, I, and this is why. Because he says, your kingdom come. Your will be done. The will's not being done unless the kingdom come. The reason it's a pause and a stop is because his kingdom. Now, it's super interesting because the worship team didn't know I was going to be preaching this. And they were saying the whole song about it. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the, hey, your. Now, look. Because listen to what he's saying. The will is that, let's forget about the will. No, let's just forget about the next sentence. That first one, when he says, the kingdom come, that means that his kingdom rules and reigns. It governs your life. Your kingdom come. You are king. You rule and reign. You make decisions. You have authority over my life. When his kingdom come, when he is ruling and reigning, 
His will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why? Because heaven will be coming out of you because you'll be, be led by the Spirit according to what He's saying and the authority and the rule and reign of His kingdom. Some of you are like, how do I know I'm doing His will? Well, He has to rule and reign. He has to govern. He has to be king. And then, oh, this is so good. Give us this day, our daily bread. Notice that before that, he, it doesn't say, and when you ask for, like, everything you want. The perspective of prayer has never been about what we want. It's never, look at your neighbor and tell him, it's never been about you. <laughs> Go ahead and turn it around and, and, and let somebody else tell you, it's never been about you. Hey, hey, why don't you just stand up real quick and point at somebody and go, it's never been about you. Go ahead, hey. <laughs> hey, we love today. Everybody's like, it's not you over there. <laughs> why? Why we need to know this? Because when we have in proper perspective that he's our father, that his kingdom rule and reign and governs everything, and that his will be done on the earth, then you say, God, give me what I need today to accomplish the things that you need me to accomplish. It's not about you. It never has been. The problem is we start, you know, God starts doing stuff in our life, and all of a sudden we think, oh, it's about me. Nothing is about you. You're dirt. Walmart, I mean, Home Depot, $4 a bag. You can dress up dirt. It's cool. It'll get dirty. He sees value in us. And then he goes and forgive our debts, and we'll talk about that on Monday. Forgiving our debtors. I just wanted to go there because I want you to understand that he's telling them in the beginning, whenever you do this, whenever you do that, whenever you do this, it's not about you. Pray like this for what I want on this planet. You're like... Well, what about me? Because that's your first question. He goes, I got you. That's why you seek for the kingdom and his righteousness and all else is added to it. I tell this all the time, and I try not to say it sometimes because I don't know. People get weird. And, but like I, I, every, every door that's been open, I've never went after it. I don't even know how they're going to. They just come because he opens doors that no man can open, and he closes. No, right. right? So like I, I don't know how it works. When I start getting, because I do, I'm human like all of y'all, God checks me. I'm just willing to listen. You want me to be, I'm going to be a little vulnerable. You want me to be vulnerable? Ooh, this is scary. They're going to judge me. So I'm like, man, I'm going to write this book. I'm like, yeah. Killing the game. Even though I'm nervous. Even though I'm frightened. I go, you know, I'm going to do what I did last time. And so, you know, I lock myself in a room. Day one, and I go, I got everything. I made Ruthie bring me my dope, like this sweater that's all beat up, but I love it. I go, bring me the sweater. I left the sweater. I start, li listen to what I'm saying. I'm like, I left the sweater. I'm not comfortable enough. I can't write. Oh, my God, bring it. And so she brings the sweater. Ooh, I put it on. I'm like, it says, that's crazy. You know, that's God. I'm like, what? I'm like, this is dope. And so I sit down. I have my water. I have all my books. I'm like, okay, Lord. Let's go. And all of a sudden, I felt like the faucet that was running, I felt like it went. And I was like, that little. I'm like, that's it? So I go to the Lord. I go, man, God, we got to write this. And he's like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. He goes, I want to spend time with you. See, that's when you know, when he tells you to stop or he says, hey, show up for seven days. And you're like, I got all this stuff to do. That's how you know that it's about you. So a little of that, I guess, was creeping in there, you know, and he wanted to show me. So I sit down. And uh, he's like, yeah, I want to talk. I go, God, I have a deadline. You know, it's charisma, all the stuff, you know, God. Like, he don't know, right? But he's like, 
yeah, it's cool. He's like, what if you miss the date? What if you miss the whole publishing thing? I said, well, you don't like that. That's, you know, I try to like, you know, reason with him, responsibility and stuff. He said, yeah, but if you're talking to me and you miss it, I'm good with that. Are you? Ooh. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why? I started having that moment. At first, I started thinking it was the enemy. So I'm in the room going, break. Break in Jesus' name. It's a true, true story. I'm thinking that the neighbors are going, oh, my God, he's beating somebody. I, I did. I just thought the cops were going to roll because I'm like, break. Because that's what we do as Christians. We blame everything. We think, oh, no, oh, no, the enemy's got me. No, the enemy thought he had me, but Jesus said, you are mine. Right? So all of a sudden, I'm sitting in the thing. He's like, yo, I just need you to. So now he shows me. He goes, I just want to spend time with you. I go, fine. Day two, I start doing good. Because by then, I postured my heart. I already, me and God, we have a really good relationship. And so I go, God, no problem. I get it. Not a big deal. I'll spend time with you. That's all you want to do. I don't care about the book. I don't care. I'm good. I mean, you do it when you want to do it. He's like, great. So he tests me. He says, sit down and spend the whole day with me. Is I going to write anything? I'm like, okay. So after that day, that second day, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. He goes, go write this. So I write a little bit. He's like, done. So I'm like, okay. I mean, very little too. To test my heart, right? Dog. And so all of a sudden... I said, you know, I'm going to go worship the Lord on Sunday. When I come on Sunday, he downloads 10, 15,000 things, and he gives me a bunch of stuff that he would have gave me on those two days. Because it's when he wants to and how he wants to. But my flesh was getting in the way. Are you with me? My flesh looked like Isaiah 58, 3 through 7. Look, it says, why have we fasted, but you have not seen? So this is, this is people telling God this. Why are we fasting and you haven't seen? We've denied ourselves, but you have not noticed. Right? God, I've been fasting all these years, praying. I still have the same year. Nothing's working. He said, look, you do as you please. He's telling them. On the day of your fast, and oppress all your workers. You fast with contention and strife, and strike viciously with your list. Right? So you're fasting, and you're on Facebook and social media, and you talk about everybody, and you're gossiping tongue, and you fight, and you do all this stuff. So you're fasting, and you're not changing. You're fasting for you. Right? You know, you see the little funny ones where they're like, you talk in tongues, but you cuss everybody out. Yeah, you do that for you. You cannot fast as you do today, hoping to make your voice heard on high. While the fast I choose be like this, a day for a person to deny himself, bow his head like a reed and spread out sackcloth and ashes. Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Isn't this the fast I choose to break the chains of wickedness, to untie the ropes of the yoke, to set the oppressed free, and to tear off every yoke? It is not to share, is it, is it not to share your bread with the hungry, to bring poor, uh, bring the poor and homeless into your house? Even that, you say that and you read that and you go like, oh, bring the homeless to my house. And I'm thinking, have you, when's the last time you stopped for a homeless guy? But anyway, let's keep going. This is, this is all just God speaking to his people, Right? Uh, the, to clothe the naked when you see him and not to ignore your own flesh and blood see the people complained about God that, they didn't rec that he didn't recognize their religious actions their, they, their motives were impure they kept fighting they were half hearted people see we think that the purpose of fasting is like a hunger strike to get God to respond we think like hey let's all fast so that we can get everything we want hunger strike come on God we think he's a genie in the bottle. Fasting creates a hunger for God. Romans 8, 7 through 8 says, The mindset of the flesh is hostile to God because it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it is unable to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. When you look at Matthew 4, let me read you Matthew 4 real quick. Boop, boop. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and he was hungry. He fasted for 40 days and he was hungry. I, I want you to see. Remember we talked about prayer. Remember, okay, Jesus now is fasting for 40 days and he was hungry. Because when you fast, you're going to be hungry. When you fast, you might have a headache. When you fast, you're going to be urged to do certain things. 
And the goal of a fast isn't just to not eat food so you could lose weight. The goal of a fast is that when that desire kicks on, you get to feed it the Word of God. Amen. Right? Because the enemy tempts him at his weakest point to strengthen his spirit. He's in there to strengthen his spirit, man. So in his weakened point, he gets tempted, and what does he say? It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. So he's like, here, feed your flesh. Whatever's feeding your flesh. He goes into things, I'll give you all these things. And he's always answering with the word. Why? Because he's teaching us how to fast. He's like, look, when you're fasting and your desire comes up, you want to get, maybe you have a, listen, you're going you're gonna to have an attitude. Maybe you always have an attitude. Your attitude is jacked up. You're always angry about little tiny things. You're like, oh my God. You always got a, a thing to say. You have all these problems. It's not really that serious. I see everybody the way they're dressed in here. It's not that serious. Some of you can probably not have some meals. Because we act, listen, I hear this all the time, like I'm starving. This is happening. This, and I'm like, dude, you're tripping. You go out to eat every day of the week sometimes. I just came back from a place where a kid might have a glass of milk the whole entire day. And you're like, oh, my life? Tripping. Tripping. I'll never complain again. I'm done. Like, I'm done. I don't even get mad no more. I go, I'm going to be the first Hispanic not to have high blood pressure. I'm stress free. I tell Ruthie all the time, I go, baby girl. And I'm so serious about it. I'm like, for what? Like, what are we, comp no, no, we're doing amazing. You love me? She's like, yeah, I love you, but we're doing great. She's teaching us that every time one of those things, listen, your breath might stink. You ain't eating. Nothing going in there. <laughs> right? You roll up. Hey, what's up? They're like, ooh. <laughs> you fasting? Me too. Ah. You know. <laughs> All of these things might happen. You might get hangry. You get hangry when you can eat. I just need you to. So hangry is like 2.0 hangry. At that moment, you're supposed to. Feed it the word. You're supposed to get closer to God. Man, I know I'm hungry, God. Why? So that when you do start eating, you know how to handle those fleshly impulses that you get. <laughs> Satan is always offering us alternative things to God's plan. Jesus is always using the word of God. If the Son of God did not rely on his flesh to live in obedience to God, then we can't either. What kind of fast and how long? Right now, we're, we're, we're doing a seven-day fast. Seven days of prayer and fasting. Seven days of prayer and fasting. Throughout the year, we're going to pick different days to fast. But you as a person, remember, whenever you fast, that means you should be fasting. Whenever you give, that means you should be giving. Whenever you pray, that means you should be. But do it like this, not like that. Right? So you make a decision how long. So fasting is abstaining from food or sex. Like that's where the, the air leaves the room. <laughs> we're, some of us have gotten good with the food. I remember not long ago I was sitting with some men and we were all having like men conversation. And uh, we're like, yeah, you know, the Bible says fast sex. And forget about it. Everybody started sweating because they're thinking, please don't say that that's what we're fasting. Some of the men are sweating right now. <laughs> You're like, is that, the, is, that, is that what he's talking about? To weaken the flesh and strengthen the spirit. The only reason you do those things is to weaken the flesh and strengthen the spirit. To weaken the flesh and strengthen the spirit. I'm going to give you some scriptures and I'm going to show you the, the fasts. Okay? Biblical fast. This whole like Facebook, Instagram. Yes. You could leave that as a distraction because you get fleshy with that too. But really what, what, what gets you hangry is not, oh, you know, Facebook and stuff. That just gets you, like, wigged out, like if you're on drugs. So I'm going to give you this right here. Because remember, as believers, the reason this is, is because you identify with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So you're constantly fasting to kill 
the flesh, kill the flesh. Right, right when, when you don't, when, people that don't ever fast with the intentionality of getting closer to God and praying and all that, you're fleshy. That's why, like a much, let's say a mature believer, if he's mature, he has a regular practice of fasting. If you're kind of young and you haven't, that's, you're super fleshy, right? And we're trying to, like, get you to see that, hey, you're really fleshy. You, you know, the church of Corinth was super, we call them carnal. Fleshy. But, but that's just not what gives glory to God. But look at this. The regular fast is done by its abstaining from all food, both solid and liquid, except for water. Now, I'm going to say these things, and remember, if you have a, you know, medical condition and stuff like that, um, you, you might fit one of these, check with your doctor, right? But, you know, it's funny because a lot of times people, I hear, I've heard people say, well, you know, this medical thing, and so they're, you know, uh, I, I got to eat. Okay, great. Then do the Daniel fast. Why do you got to eat four tacos? And why do you got to eat? Like, you're going to say you could change your food. You're like, yeah, I got to eat. So you got to eat all that? Like, why not just change your food? Why? Because it's going to hurt your flesh, and you're going to devote yourself. At that moment, when you feel that rising, you go to the Lord, and you pray. That's how you handle the stuff when you are eating, right? So you got regular fast. Uh, that's, if you want to read where that's at, Jeho- uh, 2 Chronicles 20. 2 Chronicles 20. Uh, partial fast. Uh, Daniel, the Daniel fast, Daniel 10. He spent three weeks fasting certain foods, everything that grew from the ground. You have the absolute fast. Ooh, this one right here. It's a full fast, no food, no water. Esther 4.16. This is where you see Queen Esther. No food, no water. She, all her people were going to die. They were going to kill all the Jewish people. And so she and her people decided to do a full fast. And obviously everything got turned around. Now here's the last one, sexual fast. You go write Exodus 19:15, where they were about to encounter the Lord in Mount Sinai and they were wanted to prepare, so they abstained from sex for three days. Now I thought it was kind of funny, because think I could just see all the men. Guys, we're gonna not have sex for three days. Oh, three days. <laughs> I'm thinking, wow, <laughs> man, okay. But they did that for three days. You also see it in 1 Corinthians 7:5. Uh, where a married couple can come and mutually be in agreement to abstain from sex for a short period of time, but to devote themselves to prayer. Key word, right? Because we're like, well, we haven't, we've been doing a sexual fast. We haven't, the sexual fast is, and I can, I understand it because your body craves that. And so you got to be in agreement because if you're not in agreement, the scripture continues. Go read it for yourself. First Corinthians 7, 5. If you're not in agreement, you're giving the devil the opportunity to jump in into the middle of that situation. But you know, for me, I always think about that stuff. And when I see that, I think like, man, I want to do that. Why? Because I want to see what it does. If it's saying it, then... Everything is about being dependent upon God. Fasting increases our dependence for God. That's what it does. You're not fasting just so that he can kind of do what you want him to do and twist his arm so his will can fit your plan. So I got five things. The prophet Joel, he called for a solemn assembly. You can write this down, Joel 1.14, 2.12, 2.15, Two twenty-five and 26. I'll say that again. Joel 1, 14, 2, 12, 2, 15, 2, 25, and 26. And why I'm giving you these scriptures, I want you to go read it for yourself. You know, I saw this thing the other day. Like, don't take, when we say hangouts and all that, don't take my word for it. Go read the scriptures that we give you. And see what Jesus says to you. And then if you choose to be like, yeah, I don't want to do that, then that's on you. That's between you and him. It ain't on me. I'm just delivery boy. My job's really not that important. I just deliver. Hot food, though. So we're going to pray for these things, that God would bless Israel 
and America and our economy in our 2024 election. Everything there is about our government and about God's people. That he would bless Israel and America, our economy, and our election in 2024. According to Joel 1.14, 2.12, 2.15, 2.25, and 26. We're going to pray, number two, for our family. What's the plan for your family? Have you actually took to the Lord? What's the plan for your family? You're going to ask Him to bless families. And we're going to pray for our marriages to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Why? He's always coming after the marriages, man. He wants to take the man out. Takes the head out, the body falls, right? Um, always remember that when we're praying for families, um, sometimes it takes generations for it to unfold. It takes generations. If you're like, uh, like in my family, I'm, I'm the one who made the decision. So it's going to take a little while for generations to happen. But it came through one person making a decision. Maybe you're the one that made the decision. If it was made before and you were raised in that, then somebody made a decision somewhere. And so you're seeing that generationally. So when we're praying for families, let's pray generationally. One thing that I loved about Christmas, let's give it up for Generations Department. <laughs> little by little, I'm always telling people, I go, look, it's not just daycare. Not even the kids. I love the fact that they're getting... Uh, exposed to Jesus and His Spirit. I love the fact that generationally, like this Christmas service that we had, it was all these generations doing this stuff. It was incredible. The power of this stuff. I'm telling you, what they did this year was just like phenomenal. The pajama girls, forget about it. (laughs) And you saw all these generations. That's what you saw, generationally. Like I didn't have to say nothing. I just talked about what they did. That's important. Another thing we want to pray about is health and long life. Let me tell you something. When these guys prayed, because this is what we do, we'll start praying, Lord, give me good health and long life. But then you go eat 14 cheeseburgers. (laughs) Give them something to work with. If you're praying for these things, then you come in agreement. That's, That's... Prayer is the exchange. It's communion, right? I'm talking to him. He's giving me something. So I'm pretty sure if you're praying for health and he goes, go work out. (laughs) Then rest assured, you're probably not listening and you're not going to work out. So then you're going to have this. (laughs) But if we're praying for health this year and long life, maybe you need to tweak some of your lifestyle. We're praying for family. Don't just be like, yeah, fix my family and not become a part of that. That means you have to call, text. That means you have to meet. That means you have to care. That means you have to forgive, have mercy, all those great things. It just doesn't fall. Oh, I just get busy as I want to be, and that will get taken care of because I just prayed. No. That's not how that works. Believe God for an abundance of work. Everybody say work. Some of you got scared to say that word. Say it again, work. work. <laughs> I have to, you know, because with all the unemployment and all that stuff that happened in that season, it made a lot of people lazy. So we want an abundance of work. We want miracle money. A that's crazy, no, that's God money. Everybody say it with me. A that's crazy, no, that's God money. Why? So we could be like, what? And to be cribs? No. It's so that we could build the kingdom, so that God will give us kingdom ideas, and we can build it. Pastor Ruthie and I, we've been like taking days whenever we take little afternoons. We, I don't know, I became obsessed with hard.com. I'm like obsessed right now. I'm like, I am not going to. That I'm obsessed with. And so we went, we've seen places, and I'm like, okay, acreage. And I'm estimating and calculating stuff. And I'm just putting myself to where God can bless it. And he's giving me ideas. And I see like land with maybe like a place for when people get out of prison maybe they're in the big home first and then we have maybe three acres of like little tiny homes where they could actually live and live within community and we could help them disciple and walk it out we you know building love city where we have businesses come on we have hair salon we have all this stuff with businesses that are all believers 
so that they're spending all week there and then it's it's because i want ministry through the week come on and here's the crazy part why is that crazy it's got money because every, i'm telling you they i've been beat down with this for forget about it years i meet one every couple months where they're like you need to move to the woodlands you need to move to Katy. You need to move to Sugarland. You need to move to Magnolia because you're never going to get out of that shopping center with the people you have. Oh. I'm just telling you what it is. Why? You know those people don't tithe. You want me to give you real? Y'all can't handle real. Those people don't tithe. Those people don't. And so I'm just of a firm believer. I'm like, no, 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 no. You got me twisted. These people are going to be tithing, serving. They're going to be discipled. They're going to be fasting. They're going to be prayer. Their families are going to change. I don't want to bring more light into a righteous room. I need the people that are righteous and right standing with God to come together to build so that we can affect communities, so that we can bring light into a place that has no light. That's why I'm doing this. I didn't do this like, I'm going to have a profession. I'm just going to go to McDonald's. I'm going to, no, it's, God tells me one day to build it. You're great. But that's not why I did this. I see people like complain. They go, oh, you're not going to believe what happened the other day in the woodlands, you know? Da -da -da -da. You know, somebody had told me the story the other day, which I'm super compassionate about. They're like, you're not going to believe. They tried to open my door at the stoplight in the woodlands. They tried to open my door, and, you know, this is a real event. And I go, yeah, I know. I go, the problem is because we keep building all this stuff, and everybody keeps focusing here. I said, let me tell you something. Cancer spreads. That's somebody from over there coming over here. Unless we stop it, it keeps going, baby. They, they don't have stuff over there. They run out of stuff. We just don't ignore it. I love the fact. There's a guy, boom, he's been coming to church here, prison. He's like, man, I got a job. I got this. There's another guy that was here in the first service. He's like, man, my life is going great. I'm doing this. I joined the hangout, you know. I'm like, this is awesome. Awesome. He came in. He has a little jacket on. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, man, you've been out 11 days. He's like, man, God is good, man. You get what I'm saying? Another guy, hey, God, I'm making $26 an hour now. You know, like, you hear that, and that's what gets me excited. That's why you're needed. We think like, oh, no, no, you're needed. If you're in this room, you're needed. You just think, oh, God's in, just me and you, God. Oh, for me. No, that's not how that works. I want to show you something. Oh, the last one is for his people to be free. His people to be free. I'm tired of seeing a bunch of believers not free. Free, like free. You've submitted to the authority of the enemy, and he's got you bogged down. And as long as he can keep convincing you that as long as you have finances, <laughs> that you're good, let me remind you to all my wealthy people. I'm going to give you a verse, okay? Nothing wrong with being wealthy. I just want to put this in perspective. Do you remember? He said to the wealthy guy, You fool! This night I take your soul! <laughs> so think about it. You're like, man, I'm going to... He's like, yeah. <laughs> idiot. <laughs> if I take your life, it doesn't matter what you got. You could have $10 billion. He's like, your life is mine tonight. That's what he told him. Go look it up. And you're over here like, wealth, wealth, wealth. Okay. It's good in the proper perspective. Proclamation of uh, 97, Abraham Lincoln. I'm becoming a historian right now, and we'll close. <laughs> yeah, if my teachers could see me now. <laughs> Heather, they'd be proud. Heather. They'd be proud. They'd be like, oh, wow, he's learning history now. This is where I wish I would have paid attention in school because I would have had more history. Now I've got to cram it all in there. <laughs> they say that they have Mark Anthony, Jennifer Lopez, and Juan Martinez. <laughs> then somebody's like, this dude is off. It's okay. <laughs> I got to make you laugh so that I'm trying to lower your hospital bill for 2024. Laughter is medicine. If I keep you laughing. Some of you all need that laugh. 
Some of y'all just stopped smoking and you're excited that I make you laugh without the, without the weed. So God has a purpose. Amen? Okay. He appoints a national, Abraham Lincoln, 1863, appoints a national day of fasting to come and be humble and pray. I think it was April 30th. I mean, you know, we're going to give you dates, but the, whatever this date is, I believe it's April 30th. We're going to pray and fast. We're going to meet every year. We're just going to meet. Now, I'm going to tell you what happens at the end, but I don't need you to fast and pray so you can think of the outcome. I just need you to think of praying and fasting. And I'm going to read this to you. He's proclamation. I want you to think about this. The whole United, hey, United States of America. And I said, I, when I was talking to the Lord, I go, Lord, I don't know if I could get the whole United States of America to listen to me. I got a number. <laughs> That's either like a number, a jacket. You know, I came out of prison. Okay, let's keep going. Don't run if it's your first time. I'm safe. Okay, so I could just imagine the president of the United States just telling everybody. And I said, Lord, I, can't, I don't know if everybody's going to listen to me. He said, if you can get this church right here to listen to you, we're ahead of the game. Because what, what, how I will move on behalf of your hearts, postured in the right place, fasting and praying, the world will wonder and so just like we're reading this story. So let me, let me read it to you. Let me read it. Uh, okay, this is a proclamation. This is what he said. Whereas the Senate of the United States, devoutly recognizing the supreme authority and, and just government of Almighty God in the affairs of men and nations, has by a resolution requested the president to designate and set apart a day for national prayer and humiliation. And whereas it is the duty of nations as well of men of own their, to own their dependence upon the overruling power of God, to confess their sins and transgressions in the humble sorrow, yet with assured hope that genuine repentance, everybody say genuine repentance, genuine repentance. and lead to mercy and pardon, and to recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by all history that those nations only are blessed uh, Nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. I'm going to read you a little more. I'm going to read you a little more. And it's so much as we know that by His divine law, nations like individuals are subjected to punishments and chastisements in this world. May we justly fear that the awful calamity of civil war, which now desolates the land, may be put uh, but a punishment inflicted upon us for our presumptuous sins to the needful end of our national reformation as a whole people. We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. Come on! This gets me excited. I don't know about y'all. I want to kick this iPad across the room. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. Let me tell you what happened. Uh, let me spoiler alert. So, civil war, everything's desolate, everything's messed up. The President of the United States gets the whole country to fast and pray, to posture their heart in a place of humility. Come on, to come and say, Lord, forgive me. I repent for making it about me. What? And the whole country, for four years, they did this. Do you know what happened? <laughs> say no. Oh, well, let me tell you. Let me tell you what happened. For 28 years after that, the United States of America surplused. They got more ideas than any other country. At that time, Europe was building all the cars. After the fast, the United States of America became number one in cars, automobiles, ideas, creativity. You think that's coincidence? They took four years of prayer and fasting, and America all of a sudden booms. Out of the Civil War, trust me, Civil War, everything's desolate. You heard it in the, the address. Everything's messed up. How could we even prosper, they're probably thinking. He takes it to God. What will you do? Will we come together? It's seven days. Seven days. And if your thought is instantly, well, I don't know if I have time, then you're doing everything you do, you do it for you. Harsh statement, but the truth. Why? Because that's when you really see. You, if I don't mention that, you don't really see. If in your head you're trying to figure out if you have time for God, then that's a problem. 
And then you start thinking, well, I could do it over here, can I? Sure. But if your pastor is saying, this is what the Lord said, let's meet together for seven days. Now I understand if you work at night. I, I get that. I get if you already have plane tickets and you're not going to be in the country. I get that. But if you're at home watching Netflix, then you have to check your heart. You take this to the Lord. It's seven days to come together and pray for our country, pray for our families and marriages. That's the list. And then we're going to trust that the Lord will take care of us and whatever, however. And we're going to ask him for what we need to build the kingdom, to get ideas. Because if he did it for Abraham Lincoln, then he'll do it for Get Right. Everyone to your feet. Woo. I'm excited. You practice this, this? I'm telling you. You might have never fasted. But I, I started off the thing about the fleshly impulses. Because you know what gets you usually into trouble is you get a thought or you get in your flesh and then you want to beat everybody up or you get in your flesh and you want to smoke or you get in your flesh. That's your flesh telling you to do that. Fasting is going to help you. When those urges come, you're going to pray. It doesn't have to sound like, you know, in Isaiah 57. It's just like God man, I'm so hungry right now, and I'm catching an attitude, but I want to have your mind. I want to have the mind of Christ. And Lord, I, I'm sucking right now. Like, my head hurts. I want to, like, yell at everybody. But Lord, I, I, I want to submit the way I'm feeling to you. Why? So that when you eat again, and that rises up, you know how to kill it. I almost brought a whole group up. I don't know where I get this. I think it's a, a show. Kill it, and kill it, and kill it, and kill it, kill it, and kill it. There's like a show. Everybody's like, what? Walling out. That's the show. That's the Lord right there. You hear the train? Everybody jump on. <laughs> All right. Oh, Lord, I'm sorry. You made me this way. Okay. I want you to close your eyes for a moment. We close our eyes so that we can totally be devoted and focused to what the Lord is saying. And I want you to say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? And as he's talking to us, we can make a decision in our hearts. We get wrapped, we laugh hard and often, we love to have fun. But we also like to make the main thing the main thing. I wonder what would happen if we came together to pray. I wonder what would happen if all three services came. We'd have people praying in the hallway, outside. They'd say, what's going on there? Say, we're praying. God's going to give us our daily bread for what we need. I believe we're going to have property. I believe all that's going to take care of itself as we come to build a kingdom. The whole world will see. Say, how did those guys do that? And it's because a bunch of people decided to make a decision in their hearts to fast, pray, and disciple, to be disciples, to make Christ known by the way they love. What is God saying to you? There's going to be some people in the workshop, some pastors, ministers, that will pray with you. If you're in this room and you're like, man, I need prayer. I need somebody to talk to. I need to get something off my chest. Heavenly Father, I pray right now that you speak to their hearts. Show them their hearts. May this year everything we do, we do to give you glory. Every time we're going to make a decision this year, I pray that they'll remember these words. Is this decision going to give you glory? 
We're going to be praying for marriages. I feel like there's some that are struggling with some things. And just ask yourself the question, is your decision going to give God glory? If it's not, I would ask you to reconsider. Maybe you struggle with something. Your flesh is always getting in the way. Does the decision give God glory? Will you join us to pray and to commit a fast and get closer to the Lord this year so that we can be made in His image? In Jesus' name.